VCA noodle, chicken noodle dinner, <laughs> not chicken neuter dinner, chicken noodle dinner and bake sale. And uh, we're offering both eat in and carry out. Uh, the thing about carry out is that, that we want that to be reasonable. So you, it'd be like one meal that you're carrying out, not five <laughs> gallons, okay? Uh, because we'd run out of chicken noodles quickly. Uh, it is a, a free will offering. Again, all of that is to go to help the, with the uh, Christian school. Then next Sunday, October the 4th, will be our DVD Sunday, so come early for that. We've been looking at the series called Foundations, dealing with, uh, uh, basically it's a secular humanism evolution versus biblical pre creation debate. So. Uh, it's been really, really good. I encourage you to get in on that. But you have to come 15 minutes early for that 9:45. Work day this coming month will be on the 24th, and again, family day the 25th. Just a couple of up, updates uh, or the projects that we're doing. Uh, the the new video equipment is installed. Yay! That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is we don't have a clue how to use it. It's just hanging there looking real good. Uh, but we're supposed to get the training on that tomorrow evening. Lord willing, next week we'll be streaming using the new equipment. Uh, looking forward to that. Also, just an update on, uh, we're calling it the barn project or shop project. We're going to build a 24 by 30 uh, building to put our um, outdoor equipment in and also have a place to work on like VBS projects, stuff like that. Um, I hired an architect last week trying to get the permits, and once we get the permits, we'll do the site work, and then after the first year, they'll start putting the building up. Uh, if, again, I've mentioned this, uh, I, I really don't like to talk about money, but things cost money. You ever notice that? <laughs> uh, and that project's no different, so if you'd like to give towards that, just make sure you specify for the shop project, and we'll make sure it goes towards that. All right, enough of that. Let's sing hymn number 44. Saying, if you're able, as Bruce comes to lead us. 44 in your hymnals.
prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Indeed, Father, great things you have done mm -hmm. in our lives and in the world in general. We pray, Father, this morning that you might bless now as we meet together by your Holy Spirit. Just saturate us in uh, this service today. Mm -hmm. And Father, we would pray that if there's one who just needs you as a personal Savior or one who needs a closer walk with you this morning, that we might see the evidence of that manifest today in the service. Just crown it with your grace. Yes. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, you may be seated. It's time for pay march, so you might want to find a place of safety. 111, in your hymnals, 111. of admission, I think. Amen. All right, I got good news for you. Beginning next week, Morris has decided to rededicate his life to the Lord, and he's going to be uh, doing his offering thing, which many of you have shared that you've missed that, so uh, he's going to be taking that up. <laughs> it's uh, plus this morning, if you look at the at the offering report, he said, it's bad. He said, I got to do something. <laughs> so, I don't know if he's going to make a difference or not, but anyway, uh, he'll be taking over the offering responsibilities next week. Meantime, you're stuck with me, and I, I have no story, no joke, or anything. So just ask the men to come at this time, and we'll receive the offering this morning. Again, uh, if you, you can find out what is going on as far as our weekly offering, uh, if you'll just check the bulletin uh, offering report, the weekly general fund needed is 2300 weekly missions 2230 and then you can look and see what the last week's offering was and then you can say oh my all right uh, but god's good he'll meet our needs so we'll trust him to do that colton would you ask the lord's blessing on you heavenly father god we just thank you for another day we can be together lord we 
thank you that you supply every need. Father, whatever right now may be on our hearts, help us to get it without thinking more of it, Lord, and help us to remember that, God, that we can never outgive you, Father. Right. You give up all things to us. Good. So, Father, help us now and bless this offering. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. tells us that we ought to outdo each other and give an honor and have brotherly affection to one another. Amen. And part of what I wanted to do with the teens is, and the youth group <coughs> can make this a joint effort is we don't want to be hearers of the word, we want to be doers of the word. And something that we want to recognize is that the greatest of us is the least of us is those who serve in the church and I think that goes kind of unrecognized a lot of times. And so we kind of nominated somebody, we pray on it, we nominate, and we put them in a bucket, and then we ask God to, who we're going to pull out and, for a month, who we're going to honor. And so today, pull that up. we want to thank Chris Surface for all the work he's put in and done for the church. Amen. Um, whether it's been taking the bus and, and dropping people off and that sound booth, that can't be easy on your back. And that's important too. So we just want to thank you for all you do and just, we love you. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Thanks. All right, let's take our hymnals, turn to 158. 158.
stand together if you're able. And junior church is dismissed. <coughs> and we'll turn to 435 in our hymnals. 435. <laughs> chapter 19 as we continue this study. We are coming now to the very heart of not only John's gospel, but the gospel message. Uh, understand this morning, Christianity is not just a moral code to live by. It's not just religious things to do. Christianity is Christ and Him crucified. And we're coming to that point of John's narrative where we deal with, again, the very heart of the gospel message. And we're going to begin that, say, by looking at verses 16 through 18 of John chapter 19. John chapter 19, beginning in verse 16. Then delivered he him, therefore, to, unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him on either side one and Jesus in the midst. Let's pray. Lord, we live in a very busy world. And there's a lot of stuff that beckons our attention. But Lord, the reality is what we're going to deal with this morning is the most important subject that we can address. And Lord, how it impacts our life, how it impacts our eternity. Lord, rest on, Lord, how we respond to the message today the message of your word, the gospel message. And Lord, it's my sincere prayer that everyone in this room, Lord, would be in heaven with me for eternity. And Lord, I don't say that in a boastful way. 
Lord, only the fact that I know whom I am trusting for my eternal destiny. And it's my prayer that everyone in this room would have the same trust. And then, Lord, for those of us that know you, may you draw us ever closer, Lord, as the gospel song says, to your bleeding side. Thank you for the message and song this morning. Now I just pray the blessing on the preaching of your word. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Chuck Swindoll wrote in his Bible study on John's gospel, a gold cross hung around your neck or pinned to your lapel tells the world of your faith. It symbolizes a certain morality adhered to by Christians. And wearing it often brings a degree of respect from others. But take that tiny piece of jewelry back in time 2,000 years and try wearing it around your neck or toga. People would give you puzzled looks thinking that you were some kind of lunatic. For back then the cross was not a symbol of faith but of failure. Not of morality, but of lawlessness. Not of respect, but of unspeakable shame. Then the cross was not polished and esteemed. It loomed on the frayed hem of the city's outskirts, overlooking the garbage dumps. Made of rough cut timbers and iron spikes, it stood on the horizon, at a century at attention, standing watch for any enemies of the empire. A stoic monument that crimes against the state do not pay. A splinter vestige of barbarianism, the architecture of a renowned civilization. Today, the cross is portrayed as a thing of beauty, again, often worn of, as a piece of jewelry around the neck. But during Christ's time, it was anything but an object of beauty. It was associated with the worst offenders of society. It meant the one that was placed on it was guilty of the worst of crimes and were not only worthy of death, but an agonizing, torturous, shame-filled death. That the Roman form of crucifixion was one of the cruelest and most wicked forms of capital punishment ever devised this common knowledge. It was that kind of death that the Lord Jesus Christ suffered for us. It's important for us this morning to see just how wicked and shameful, how very painful this death was, because for one thing, it becomes another proof that Jesus Christ was who he said he was and what he accomplished. He was in fact the son of God. One reason that we can know this is that a false prophet would not willingly face the cross. It was highly unlikely likely that a person perpetrating a hoax would die as part of it. And it's absolutely beyond question to think that he would face the torturous death of the cross to perpetuate that ho hoax. So Jesus' willingness to face the cross becomes another proof that he is, in fact, the Son of God or God the Son. In our text today, John simply notes, and he bearing his cross went out to a place called of the skull, which is in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now, I want to note three things from John's record this morning. First of all, the journey of the cross. Secondly, the cross itself. And then lastly, the company on the cross. 
First of all, consider with me the journey of the cross in verse 17. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. According to most historians and commentators, it was a common thing for the criminal to carry his own cross to the place of execution. It was also customary for the con condemned criminal to carry a placard giving his name and the nature of his crime. Jesus' placard was nailed to the cross above his head. We'll see that in verse 20. This title then read, Many of the Jews. And that's from verse 19, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The procession moved from Pilate's judgment hall to the place called Golgotha. That spot where the crucifixion occurred is called the place of the skull. Uh, the English equivalent might be the place of the cranium. The Greek form Golgotha means the skull. And of course, we don't know exactly why it was called that. There's a lot of speculation. Some think that because it was the top of a hill that it resembled a skull. Others have different views of it. The only thing that we know is that it looked in some way like a skull or was something about it represented that skull. This is the place where the crucifixion took place. Now here's the thing about it. No one really knows where Calvary is at. Now if you go to the Holy Land, they'll take you on a tour and they'll show you where they think Calvary was at. But nobody really knows. I think the reason for that is because of the propensity of man to worship things like that. So we don't know where Calvary is. But here's the thing. Calvary does not save. That hill where Jesus was crucified does not save you. In fact, though we sing about it and sometimes make much to do about it, a cross doesn't save you. What saves us is what happened on that cross over 2,000 years ago. And that is Jesus Christ poured his life blood out as an atonement for our sin. That is what saves him. Now John makes a special note that Christ carried his cross and at this point by himself. Now that implies a twofold curse. First of all, death by crucifixion was in itself regarded as a curse. Paul wrote in Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Again, the death on the cross was not a glamorous thing. It was a shame-filled, torturous death and a cursed death. Deuteronomy 21, 23, His body shall not remain all night upon a tree, but thou shalt in any ways bury him that day, for he that is hanged is accursed by God. Now think about that for a minute. That refers to Jesus Christ. He, because he hung on a tree, he was accursed by God. Now again, don't think of this, the cross as something beautiful, but as a curse that Jesus Christ bore for our sakes. A shame-filled death for our sakes. Nothing pretty about the cross. In fact, anyone that was carrying it would have been marked as the lowest of humanity, the scum of the earth. But Jesus was, a, was willing to do that, to become a curse for us that we might be saved. Secondly, compelling the guilty to carry his cross intensified that shame. It's not only that he was going to be crucified, 
but that he had to carry the instrument of his death. And then thirdly, carrying it by himself, at least initially, carrying it alone would have added to the terrible punishment and the fact that the suffering servant was being sent out in complete isolation. Fourthly, going outside the city to be crucified adds another element to the cursedness. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12 and 13, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore into him without the camp bearing his reproach. Again, all of this adds to the burden that Jesus bore for us. The king of the world. Again, remember, Jesus is not just a man. He is also God incarnate. The king of the world became subject to shame and suffering, became a reproach. The incredibly rich became incredibly poor that we might be made incredibly rich. All right, secondly, let's consider the cross itself, verse 18, where they crucified him and the two other with him on either side and Jesus in the midst. One comment, commentator notes, even the Romans themselves regarded it, that is the cross, with, with a shudder of horror. Cicero declared that it was the most cruel and horrifying death. Tacitus said that it was a despicable death. Crucifixion was originally a Persian method of execution. It may have been used by them because they considered the earth sacred and wished to avoid defiling it with the body of a criminal and evildoer. So they nailed him to the cross and left him to die there and then left the vultures to complete the work. The Carthaginians took over the crucifixion from the Persian, Persians and then eventually the Romans learned it. Crucifixion was only used in the provinces of Rome. It was unthinkable that a Roman citizen should die by this death. Cicero said it is a crime for a Roman citizen to be bound. It is a worse crime for him to be beaten. It is well nigh parasite for him to be killed. And what am I to say if he be killed on a cross? Despicable beyond words, he goes on to say. It was that death, the most dreaded death in the ancient world, the death of slaves and criminals that Jesus suffered for us. According to Jim Bishop in his book, The Day Christ Died, the executioner laid the crossbeam behind Jesus and brought him to the ground quickly by grasping his arm and pulling him backward. As soon as Jesus fell, the beam was fitted under the back of his neck and on each side the soldiers quickly knelt on the inside of the elbows. Jesus, of course, gave no resistance and said nothing but would have had probably groaned as the back of his head and the thorns pressed into his scalp. Once begun, the matter was done quickly and efficiently. With his right hand, the ex executioner probed the wrist of Jesus to find the little hollow spot. When he found it, he took one of the square cut iron nails from his teeth and held it against the spot directly behind the so-called lifeline ending. Then he raised the hammer over the nail and brought it down with force. Two soldiers then grabbed each side of the crossbeam and lifted. 
As they pulled up, they dragged Jesus by the wrist. With every breath, he no doubt groaned. When the soldiers reached the upright, the four of them began to lift the crossbeam higher until the feet of Jesus were off the ground. The body must have writhed with pain. It's not an ornament, folks. The cross was an instrument of pain and death beyond description. Those who tasted its embrace did, not, embrace did not die quickly. Sometimes it would take 36 hours for them to expire. Death was caused by a combination of factors, blood loss, fever, fluid, fluid buildup in the lungs, and suffocation. Jesus did not die an easy death, but probably the most painful and shame-filled imaginable. And you know what? I could go on for a long time talking about the physical aspect of the death of Christ, and, and I would still not portray how horrible it would have been. But as bad as that was, there was something worse. It was his becoming sin for us. The sinless son of God. The sinless son of God was made sin. In that sense, he suffered in ways that we will never, ever, ever understand. He, for the first time in eternity, was separated from God the Father. In fact, he cried out one of the seven utterances on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We sing about it. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he do? Oh, how he loves you and me. If you don't take anything away this morning, anything else, please take away this, that Jesus loved you enough to go through that. Amen. Thirdly then, the companions of the cross. Verse 18 where they crucified him and two others with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. Jesus was crucified between two thieves. And by the way, that was no accident. It was prophesied. Isaiah 53 verse 12, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, he was numbered with the transgressors. As far as the observers would look at the cross, they would see three criminals. They would not make any distinction. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. By the way, there were 300 and 32 such prophecies that were fulfilled by the life and death of Jesus. A man by the name of J.P. Free calculated the mathematical probability of all these prophecies being fulfilled in one man. The likelihood is reflected in a ratio, a ratio of one to a, a number that is represented by 84 with 96 zeros behind it. In other words, if, if we would figure the mathematical likelihood, it would be impossible. But again, Jesus fulfilled all of those prophecies. The two men on each side represent all of humanity. They represent you this morning, one side or the other. 
Both were condemned sinners. Both had sin on them and in them. But something happened to one of them that forever changed his condition. Luke records it in chapter 23, verse 32. And there were also two other malefactors led away with him to be put to death. And then in verse 39, and one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him saying, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. In other words, just mocking him. But the other answering rebuked him saying, dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condition and we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Two criminals represent all of humanity because the reality is all of us are guilty before God. We don't hear this too much anymore. It's a point that the man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. The fact is we are all guilty before God. You say, well, brother Mike, I'm not such a bad man, but the problem is God doesn't grade on a curve. I, I can... If we want to use logic, it's real easy. How many, how many things do you have to steal to be a thief? One. How many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? How many sins do you have to sin to be a sinner? One. But the truth is we sin multiple times. And we're both, we are all are guilty. And again, your life is represented by those two thieves. You, we are all guilty. But to one, Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Here's the reality. We're all sinners. We are all sinners in this room. We are all sinners. Say amen. amen. <laughs> but here's the thing. Some are lost sinners and some are saved sinners. Some are represented to the one thief that just mocked the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe you even have done that kind of thing. You've made fun of Christ and Christianity and Christians. You're represented by the one. But maybe you're represented by the others who place their faith in Jesus Christ. And to you, he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. You're either a saved sinner or a lost sinner. There's no in-between. There's no purgatory. There's no time of going. To, I was reading about hell this week, preparing my article for faith and freedom. I know we're not supposed to talk about hell, but listen, folks, it's still there. Yeah. There is no purgatory, and hell's not a place of temporary purging. It's a place of eternal suffering. It's where one of these thieves went forever. Jesus didn't turn to him and say, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He turned to the one who repented and placed their faith in Christ. Now my question this morning is, which thief represents you? It's not a question of whether or not we're a thief, whether or not we're a sinner, whether or not we're guilty before God. That's settled. We're all, we all, are sinners by birth and by choice okay but are you a lost sinner or are you a saved sinner and if we're not saved by Golgotha we're not saved by the cross we're not saved by baptism we're not saved by being religious your being here this morning does not save you It's what, I should say, who was hanging on that cross that saved us. And placing your faith in him for who he is, God the Son, and what he's done. He died for, for you on Calvary to pay for your sin. And now 
he offered, just like that dying, that dying thief couldn't even get baptized. If they baptized him, they had to do it after he was dead. He couldn't do good works. He couldn't do anything. All he could do was place his faith in Jesus Christ. And that is, my friends, the only way that you can be saved is by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Every head bow, every eye closed. Again, I would ask you, which thief represents you? I, I, I'm not trying to offend you by saying you're a thief, a criminal, a sinner, because again, I, I am too. We all are. You know, I, it's not that I'm better than anyone in here. In fact, our, I, I love was becoming our main saying in our church that we are struggling people helping struggling people. We're not better, as Christians, we're not better than anybody, but we're better off because we placed our faith in the one that was hanging on the cross. Have you done that? I mean, it means renouncing ourselves altogether. It means that we... We, we can't look to any of our doings to save ourselves, but that we cast all of our faith on the one hanging on the cross. If you've done that, as a testimony of God's saving grace, would you hold your hand up high for me this morning? God bless you. All right, you may put it down. As far as I can see, I was everyone. But let me let me ask you if if you could not or should not have raised your hand you you can take care of it this morning and again we're not going to make any special hoops or anything for you it, it the 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 other thief hanging on the cross how much could he do he couldn't even go forward in an invitation amen, amen. he couldn't do anything but Place his faith in Christ. And you can do that right where you're seated this morning. It's, it's as simple as a prayer from your heart. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. And I understand that you died for my sin. And I'm trusting you to save me. If you want to pray the prayer that the thief prayed, Lord, remember me when you enter your kingdom. I, it, the words are not magic. It's the sincerity of your heart. It's the faith. This morning, if, you're, if you are praying from your heart, trusting the Lord. And again, I'm not going to come to you and embarrass you or, or make you do anything again. But I do want to rejoice my heart with you this morning. You'd say, Pastor Mike, I am trusting Jesus this morning, the one on the cross and what he did. I'm trusting that as my salvation. If that's you this morning, would you just please slip your hand up and down as I want. God bless you. Anybody else? I'm trusting Christ for my salvation. Lord, we thank you for the gospel message and I pray that Lord, if, if there is someone here again that should have raised their hand, didn't, or should have, Lord, prayed from their heart. It doesn't even matter much if they raise their hand. Lord, as long as they trust you. I pray that you'd help them this morning, that if they're trusting you to make it public, Lord, as we have this invitation. And then, Lord, again, for us who know you, may we ever be busy about proclaiming the message of the cross, namely, Jesus died for you. We'll thank you for it. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and have a couple of verses of song this morning. Give you the opportunity to respond.